Hi guys, we're going to talk about injections in this PowerPoint presentation, and we're really going to look at the safety concerns associated with injections. During lab, we will practice these, applying the safety concerns that we learn so that we are administering injections as safe as possible. Also want to remember that injections are a medication and we want to follow our six rights. So we'll talk about doing our three safety checks followed by each of those rights with medication administration. These are all the different types of injections. We're going to focus on those top three, subcutaneous, intramuscular, and intradermal. Subcutaneous, we know that that's the one that's going into that adipose or that fat tissue. And it's really important to think about how vascular the tissue is because that's going to determine how quickly our medication is going to be absorbed. When we think about the subcutaneous tissue, there are not a lot of vessels or blood supply to that adipose or fat tissue. So the absorption rate in the subcutaneous is relatively slow, especially if we compare that to our intramuscular injections. When we talk about intramuscular, it is quite the opposite. Those muscles are very vascular, they have a great blood supply, and that medication is gonna absorb much faster. And then the last one is the intradermal, and that's when we're injecting it right below the epidermis into that dermis. There's not much of a blood supply, so that absorption is even slower than the subcutaneous injection. It's important to note that because a lot of times the reason we are giving these different injections is because we want to know how quickly is it going to be absorbed. So let's look at the first thing. We want to think about when we're giving our injections, we want to make sure we have all of the right equipment that we need. The first thing that we think about is we have to give it in the appropriate route. First thing to do is check that physician's order, check the recommended route, and then go to your MAR and see which route that you're going to use to administer that medication. Remembering, if I give my medication in the wrong route, it could cause harm to my patient. A good example of this is maybe you meant to give it into the muscle and you didn't quite get it there and only got it in that subcutaneous tissue. So the absorption may be much slower as opposed to if you had used a much longer needle and gotten it into that muscle where the absorption would have been much quicker. Another consideration is the viscosity of the solution to be given. A good example of this is Ativan. This is a very common medication. It's very thick, it's very viscous. So thinking about what needle to use. If you use a really small needle, it's not gonna be able to handle that thickness of the medication. So thinking about using a bigger gauged needle at that point. The next thing to think about is the quantity of medication. So each location, whether it's the dermis, the subcutaneous, or the muscle, can only tolerate a certain amount of solution. So knowing how much each area can tolerate is important, because if you're needing to give more than what each can tolerate, you'll have to think about doing something different. Next is our body size. There's a big difference in giving injections to a 90-pound patient versus that 200 pound patient. A short needle may reach the muscle in a very thin patient, where in a large patient, you'll need a larger needle. And the type of medication, some medications are damaging to the tissues. So make sure you're familiar with those medications that could cause damage and that we aren't giving those medications that could harm our patient. As we look at the needle and the different parts of the needle, and we're gonna really look at some of these and break these down in lab so that we can look at these really closely. You see the hub there. That's what screws into the lower lock of the syringe. The next thing is the shaft of the needle and it connects right to that hub. And then the last part is the bevel. You'll hear people talk about turning the bevel up. This will help us give our medication with less discomfort, less pain. That bevel creates a narrow slit when we inject it into the tissue. If you use a long, sharp, narrow bevel, it's gonna cause less pain for a patient, which is really our goal. 
It also has less leaking of medication when you pull the needle back out. We wanna think about that when we're giving our injections. Small needle with a long bevel because it's going to be less painful for our patient. Most of these needles will come prepackaged with a syringe, but sometimes when they come individually packaged, that does allow for you to choose a different needle in size or gauge. The next thing we want to look at is the different gauges of needles or how big the needle is. And it's really important to note that the larger the gauge, the smaller the needle. So let's look at a couple of these here. You can see in this picture, the larger the gauge, the smaller the needle. So you can see on the left of the picture, if you have a 27 gauge needle, it's a very small thin needle one that you might use for that intradermal injection. Where on the right side of the picture, if you have an 18 gauge needle, that's a small number, it actually is a much larger needle. And you would wanna use that for maybe an intramuscular injection or even drawing blood from your patient. This one will cause a lot more pain because it's just a bigger needle than those on that left side of the picture. So make sure you understand the concept of this. The big number gauge is a smaller sized needle. So then after we've decided what gauge of a needle we're gonna think about, well, let's talk about the different types of the injections. Intradermal, like we've said, is right underneath that skin. So we're gonna use a very small needle, a 25 to a 27 gauge. I think ATI states 26 to 27, you're just gonna have to know what, what uh, your hospital uses, and that's gonna vary from facility to facility. Just remember, you want the one with the smallest size that you can find. Needle length is also important. From the hub to the end of the needle is the length of the needle. So for intradermal, you would want a small length for that one. For subcutaneous, you can see that the gauge is very similar to that intradermal it's really not much different. So we do need to remember, we will need a small needle, large needles are gonna cause more pain, and the needle length is gonna also be very similar uh, because we're just trying to get into that adipose tissue just below the dermis, so we want that shorter needle. Intramuscular will need a larger gauge needle. So also think about the viscosity of the medication, we've already talked about that. And with the length, we have to think about how much tissue are we getting through to get to that muscle. So on your slide there, it says 18 to 25 gauge. It could be 20 to 25 gauge. It just, again, depends on your facility. If the medication is really thick, you wanna make sure that you're giving um, it in that larger gauged needle. The average healthy adult will need to um, about a one to one and a half inch length needle. If you have a more obese patient, you may, to, may need to think about a one and a half to two inch needle. You could use a needle up to three inches if you have a morbidly obese patient that might weigh over 300 pounds. You have to consider all of that subcutaneous tissue that you're gonna need to go through in order to get to that muscle. So let's look at some of the angles of each of these medication routes. This slide shows a really great picture of all the angles of each needle, and it's easy to see why we would need to use a different angle to get into that appropriate tissue, depending on the order from your physician. So the tip of the needle needs to be in the location where you want to give it. For intradermal, remember it's just below that upper layer of that skin, we're gonna use that five to 15 degree angle. For subcutaneous, it may depend again on the size of your patient. For very small patients, we may be at that 45 degree angle. For larger patients, we may be able to go in at that 90 degree angle. And then for intramuscular, it's pretty much gonna be at that 90 degree really to get into that muscle. When drawing from a vial, we wanna make sure we are safe. One of the biggest risks for nurses in the healthcare setting is needle sticks, accidental needle sticks. Unfortunately, that exposure to those bloodborne pathogens is one of the deadliest hazards that we face. 
Most needle sticks are preventable if we use the right safety devices. The Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act mandates that we do this. You won't find needles in the hospitals that don't have that safety mechanism mandated. The accidental stick comes when we don't use those safety mechanism devices correctly. So I want you to repeat this about 50 times today. I will always put my safety device on. So this picture shows us a really great safety device. So first, after you give that medication, your number one thing is to activate that safety device. There will be a bunch of other things that you're gonna to wanna to do. If your patient is bleeding, you'll wanna put on a Band-Aid or grab a cotton ball. You need to let them bleed. You need to activate that safety device so that no one gets hurt. Not only are you at risk, but your patient could be at risk or even family members could be at risk. There are so many different things that could be, so many people that could be at risk. So activating that device is essential. And we will practice this in lab today, or this week. Another thing is we wanna throw it in the sharps container. Put the safety device on and then put it in the sharps container. Use one hand to put that needle away Never reach down into the sharps container. Don't try to shove or poke anything down in the container. Sharp containers are very easy to locate. They're usually on the wall in every room, usually by the patient's bedside so that you have easy access to them. If you feel like you're shoving or you're poking things down in the container, then you need to dispose of that container and get a new one. So let's dive in and talk about intramuscular injections. This is where we are delivering medication through the skin and subcutaneous tissues into the muscle. Remember, this has a faster absorption rate than subcutaneous, but it does come with more risks when we're doing intramuscular. Stop and think, does this patient really need this medication in the muscle or is there a different route that would work better? Vaccines are about the only thing you give in the muscle anymore. There are still some antibiotics that we will give, but we really try to avoid this method because it is so painful for the patient after the injection. We want to make sure we get the appropriate needle length based on our patient's size, and we've talked about that. We get the appropriate gauge based on the viscosity of the medication and how deep we give it we may need a heavier gauge if it needs to pass through a lot of that subcutaneous tissue in order to penetrate those deep muscles. And then making sure we have an appropriate amount. A normal healthy adult can handle up to five mils of medication into any one muscle without much pain or discomfort. Those large volumes of medications don't absorb well. And so we really recommend never giving more than three mLs of medication into our large muscle group. And that makes sure that the patient does not have that extra discomfort, that extra pain, and that the medication is absorbed appropriately. You can see that in children, the number gets less, that in children, you don't wanna give more than two mLs, and even smaller children, it is one. Even those infants are only gonna be able to tolerate about a half mL or 0.5. If you need to give larger doses, like maybe an adult you need to give four mLs, you may need to divide that into two muscles. That way they absorb the medication appropriately from both sites. I know that it's two injections instead of one, but in the long run, it's gonna be less painful for the patient and it, they will tolerate it a little bit better. These are the sites that we'll be giving our IM injections. We will look at each of these in the lab. I do want to mention the dorsogluteal site is no longer recommended really as of about 10 years ago. Evidence showed that it wasn't safe because of the location of the nerves. It was really too easy for nurses to accidentally get the tip of that needle into one of those nerve roots and cause undue pain and possible damage. So we will learn, so we will learn that one. Um, I'm sorry, so we won't talk about that one, um, but we will focus on those top three.
So ventrogluteal is the first one we're going to talk about, and it's really the preferred site for adults and adolescents for those IM and injections up to 3 mLs. And we will look at this in lab and try to get that location. The vastus lateralis is the best location and the preferred site for our patients that are less than one year of age, usually up to about seven months of age. Um, and it can really only handle about one ml of volume. And you're going to dip, depending on the viscosity of that solution, is going to depend on the gauge of the needle that you use for this muscle. The deltoid has this very small muscle mass and really can only handle up to two mLs. You'll usually use a one to one and a half inch needle. We don't really use this muscle much in the infants or toddlers. Um, younger than three years of age because their muscle mass is so small. And you can see that little triangle there. It's a very small area where we're going to hit that really deep muscle tissue. So as we recap here, that deltoid is no more than one ml. The vastus lateralis is that preferred site for our littles. Um, we use those in up to one year of age. And the ventrogluteal is that preferred site um, for our adults that can handle most of the volume of medication. So what are some possible complications and considerations with those IM injections? These are listed here for you. Some complications could be an abscess cellulitis. And again, these complications are going to come because maybe you haven't gotten deep into that muscle where that medication needs to be. So some considerations, we've talked about most of these. Um, vastus lateralis is in our infants, those more obese patients, we're going to want to make sure we're using a larger needle length, maybe a smaller one for our thinner patients. The muscle mass usually decreases as a person gets older and make sure that patient is relaxed before the medication is entered and injected. All right, z track method is the next thing that we want to look at. What we know is when we insert a needle into the tissue, it leaves a very small hole or a track. Small amounts of medication can sometimes leak back into this track where it's absorbed into other tissues. So pulling that skin and tissue before the injection causes the needle track to take the shape of the letter C, which gives us the procedure of its name. This zigzag track line is what prevents medication from leaking from the muscle into those surrounding tissues. When we do this properly, z track method disrupts the path and the medication cannot seep back out. A good example of this method to use is with iron. Iron has a deep purple color, and if it leaks back up into the subcutaneous tissue, it can cause discoloration of the skin, like that patient may have a bruise. Or if the medication is very irritating, you don't want that to leak back into that subcutaneous tissue because it could cause damage to the skin. So I do have a question here for you. So tether, tell me whether the following statement is true or false. The recommended intramuscular site for an adult is the vastus lateralis. And that answer is false. Remember the recommended intramuscular site for an adult is the ventrogluteal or even the deltoid. Preparing the medication for injection, we're going to practice each of these in lab. But as we look at this list, we can prepare injections from a vial, an ampule, a pre-filled syringe, meaning it already comes with the medication in it. We're going to talk about mixing medications in one syringe. We're going to talk about mixing insulin in one syringe and reconstituting those powder medications. So I'm going to skip through several of these things because we are going to look at these in lab, um, but vials are that plastic or glass container in which the liquid or powdered medication is packaged in that airtight and sterile environment. So this is normally where you're going to find um, where you pull injections is from these vials. Some medications come in ampules still, still, and ampules are glass single-use containers for liquid injectable medications. We have to snap the neck of that um, injection, I mean, of that ampule, and we have to use a filter needle 
in order to draw up that medication. And then this is your pre-filled single dose syringe. We use it one time and then we throw it away. If we're not gonna use all of the medication, we're gonna um, discard that prior to injection. All right, so let's look at um, medication that's given intradermally. This is the slowest absorption rate. Um, this is how we perform our TB tests and our allergy testing. Um, we do that in this in this form because we don't want the patient to absorb those quickly. If they were absorbed quickly, they may have a systemic reaction and we don't want that. So it's important that we get these right underneath that dermis. You won't do these very often unless you work in a community nursing setting or you're doing a lot of TB testing. You're really not gonna do these very often. Please note that the amount you can give is a maximum of 0.5, but most of the time it's gonna be less than that. All of that medication goes into a tiny little wheel just underneath the skin so that none of it seeps out. And you really wanna make sure with this one that the bevel is up to allow for that small bleb or wheel to appear. Subcutaneous injections is the next one we're gonna talk about. And this is the one you're gonna give most frequently because this is how we give our insulin. So you can see on this slide, um, there are several areas with, that we're gonna give those subcutaneous injections. When we're giving these, we're looking for that collection of fat tissue. Most of, the, most of us have a lot of those, but we do know that certain areas of our body have more. The upper thigh, the back of the arms, the abdomen all have an increased amount of adipose tissue, which will help us not accidentally, accidentally get into the muscle. With subcutaneous, it does absorb at a slower rate than the muscle. We really wanna educate our patients to rotate their sites. They will have a favorite site that they like to go to all the time, but we need to make sure that they don't damage their adipose tissue or have any bruising. So we really recommend going about two inches from the previous site and rotating around to a different location. Again, they're gonna have that favorite site, but we've gotta do lots of education with them. Subcutaneous can only absorb about one mil of volume. So making sure we don't give too much if we have more than that, let's say we have 1.5, we may need to separate those into two injections. So here's my next question for you. A nurse is preparing to inject heparin subcutaneously for a patient who is post-op. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Use a 22 gauge needle, select a site on the patient's abdomen, Use the Z-Track technique to displace the skin on the injection site and observe for a bleb formation to confirm proper placement. So when we're thinking about heparin that's given subcutaneously, 22 gauge is a pretty big needle. We're probably not gonna use that big of a needle for this. Using the Z-Track technique is really only used for those IM injections to displace that skin so it doesn't go back into the subcutaneous and observing for a bleb is that intradermal. So the correct answer here is selecting a, slight, a site on that patient's abdomen, right? It's that fatty tissue that we're trying to get into. Insulin preparation is another thing we're gonna really work on in lab, but this is something you need to be familiar with. You will discuss in your farm class how to give, understand the principles of insulin, but what I want you to know is if you administer insulin, when should we administer it? So as we look at this slide, um, you're gonna see um, the insulin preparation, the onset of action, when is its peak and how long does it work? So let's say your patient got their breakfast tray and you checked their blood sugar and it was 300. So you now need to know that we need to give some insulin. The question is, when do you give it in relation to when they ate. And that is about the onset. So Novolog, right up there towards the top, states that the onset is less than 15 minutes. So if I administer it and they don't eat within 15 minutes, they could have a hypoglycemic episode. So that means when I administer it, 
they need to start eating within 15 minutes of administration. Versus, if we go down towards the bottom a little bit, that regular insulin, which is another common insulin, you have to give 30 to 60 minutes after administration. I mean, I'm sorry, you have to eat 30 to 60 minutes after administration. Either way, you would never give either of these insulins if you didn't know their breakfast tray was there. There are just so many things that could go wrong. I would hate to give it and not have something for them to eat. And we're gonna discuss these more in lab. The other thing that we will do in lab is mix these medications together. A lot of times patients will use a rapid acting insulin with maybe a regular or long acting insulin and we'll mix them in the same syringe so the patient only has to be stuck one time. Another important thing to note about insulin is it's measured in units. So another thing to repeat multiple times today is I will never drop insulin in a syringe that measures milliliters. All insulin is measured in units. So you won't draw insulin into a syringe measured in mils. If your order is to give three units of insulin, that is a very, very small dose. If you inadvertently gave three mils of insulin, you could cause your patient to go into a hypoglycemic crisis, which would be awful. All insulin syringes have an orange top, and that's just really a reminder for us that it is for insulin and only for insulin, and it's measured in units and not in milliliters. So this slide here shows you um, what that syringe looks like, um, and they are syringes that are measured in units. When we talk about mixing insulin, there are some important reminders we must remember. We never wanna mix insulin with any other medication. Insulin can only be given as a standalone medication or mixed with another insulin, except for Lantus and Levomir, those must be given individually. Remembering the onset of action of insulin is important. We wanna make sure that food is available before giving any insulin so that our patient does not get hypoglycemic. And before any administration of insulin, you should always verify your dose with another nurse because giving the wrong dose could be devastating for our patient. We will mix insulin this week in lab. The biggest and most important thing to remember is you always draw from your insulin, you draw your insulin from clear to cloudy. Clear being that fast acting insulin, such as Humalog or Novolog, to the cloudy insulin or your long acting insulin, such as Humalin or Regular. This clear to cloudy technique allows um, prevention of contamination. This slide shows you the technique of clear to cloudy, and we will discuss this more in detail during lab this week. So here are just some basic rules of thumb to keep our patients safe. And we've discussed each of these, but I wanna review them one more time. Each injection route differs based on the type of tissue the medication is entering. So remember, we have to do this safely. Before we inject, we wanna make sure that you aren't giving too much in one location. Make sure you know the viscosity of your medication. And is it the appropriate route? If there's a better route, we need to advocate for that patient. And then always make sure you give it the right way. We're gonna practice these quite a bit in lab this week. Make sure you know your landmarks. You don't wanna accidentally give an IM an injection into the bone. You, if you do, you're, it's something you're never gonna forget. So always be careful when we're giving these injections. Remember, we want to minimize pain for our patient, and here are some of these suggestions. Use the smallest needle that is suitable. If you could go smaller, go smaller. That's going to make it more comfortable for your patient. Use a very sharp needle. If you have inserted your needle to draw up medication, you have dulled that needle. So you'll want to switch it out and get a sharp needle. Select the proper site. 
apply that topical anesthetic. In peds patient, it's the norm. Um, we use a comfort promise for our pediatric patient. Some form of comfort is going to be given with every needle stick. Unfortunately, we're not as nice to our adults, but we can use an, a topical anesthetic if it's available. Engage them in a conversation. This is gonna help divert them. Um, and be comfortable with injections. And this is gonna come with time and practice. Um, hold the syringe steady, make sure you're not shaky, um, and inject that medication slowly, um, not too quickly, but not too slow and steadily. And that's gonna cause um, less discomfort for your patient. When we finish the injection, make sure you're documenting everything. Remember that's our sixth right, that we are using all of our patient's rights when giving injections. Note that you document the name of the medication, the dose, the route, the time, who gave it, where you gave it, did anything go wrong, did the patient refuse it, or were there any errors that happened? Make sure you're getting all of those documented. Patient teaching is always huge. We always wanna educate our patient on the medication. When it comes to the injection though, we wanna to talk to them about the side effects specific to whatever injection they're getting. So if it's an intramuscular injection, we're gonna educate them about, they may have some pain at that injection site. They may feel like that muscle is bruised. If it's a subcutaneous injection, it also might cause some bruising just at the site. So they may see that, so tell them that. Warn them what to expect after you give the injection, and this is gonna allow that patient to just feel more comfortable with the injection. And that concludes our chapter on injections. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email, or we're gonna talk about it in lab, and you can bring those to lab with you. Thanks, guys.